chapter 4 that we looked at last week ended on a particularly sad note. A child was born who was the grandson of Eli, and his mother named him Ichabod, which means the glory has gone. The reason for that was that in battle at Aphek, the Philistines had routed the Israelites and captured the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, which they had taken into exile or captivity. If you were an Israelite and sensitive to these things, the unthinkable really had happened. An event which, in many ways, is the worst thing to happen to Israel from this time right up until the Babylonians will destroy the city and carry away the children of Judah into captivity. But while there was sorrow in Shiloh at the end of chapter 4, at the beginning of chapter 5, there is triumphalism in Ashdod. The Philistines are rejoicing, and although it's not stated, when you come to chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2, there is this scene of triumph among the Lord's enemies. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. In the ancient Near East, when tribal uh, groups went into battle and maybe they had their god with them or they conquered an area and there was a sanctuary there, it was common that the victors would take their enemy's god as a symbol that they had totally vanquished their foes. That's what's going on here. Sometimes in our televisions we see what goes on out in the Middle East when something like this happens and they all run through the streets and maybe they fire their guns in the air and they're chanting and they're carrying things along in a procession that we've seen it recently even in Iran and I get the idea that something like this is maybe going on among the Philistines. They're carrying the ark of the Lord, they're shouting for triumph, and they go to their temple and they set it beside their God as a symbol that they have totally vanquished the Israelites. But although the ark of the Lord has been captured, the Lord of the ark has not been conquered. And the Philistines are about to learn what Israel and the prophets of Baal would learn later at Mount Carmel in the days of Elijah. Choose today who you're going to follow. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the Lord vanquishes the prophets of Baal upon the mountain. And the people cry out, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. When you come to the end of this episode in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and chapter 6, that is to be the response of your heart. The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Well, who is this Lord God? Three things, and then we'll make a number of points of application. First of all, the Lord is the God who reigns. The Lord is the God who reigns. We're introduced to Dagon at the end of verse 2. And Dagon was the chief deity of the Philistines. They had adopted him from the Canaanitish religion that they absorbed when they moved into this region. But Dagon was a God who had a head and body and arms of a man. And then he had a tail like a fish. Now, you may have seen these fantastical creatures that people call mermaids. Well, in some ways, Dagon was like a merman. He had the head, the body, and the arms of a man, but he had the tail of a fish. And his image was found in the temple of Ashdod. And so the Philistines march in with this box, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and they set it beside or in front of the statue of Dagon in verse 2. Dagon has triumphed over Jehovah. But then we read verse 3 and verse 5. 
and discover that the idol of the Philistines cannot stand before the symbol of the presence of the Lord. When I was reading this passage to you a moment ago, <clears throat> honestly, I was I'm struggling with coughing here. I was actually struggling not to laugh when I was reading this portion of God's word to you because there's, there's divine humor here. It's almost like satire. God is ridiculing the gods of the Philistines. What happens? Well, on the first morning, they wake up. And Dagon is prostrated on his face before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And suppose you were a Philistine priest and you walked in and you saw this and you thought, hmm, you know, that's strange. And there you are, you go over and pick your God up, give him a little bit of help. You know, he's dependent upon you. You're not dependent upon him. So you set the fish-tailed God back up on his tail again, and you go about your business, and the next morning you come in, and it's worse. Not only is he upon his face, but his head has been cut off, and his hands have been cut off, and only his stump is left. That was another symbol of being totally vanquished in battle. Mm -hmm. The enemy would conquer a people and they would take their king and they would cut off his head and cut off his hands. You remember David and Goliath? And after David throws the stone and he hits Goliath, what does he do, children? He gets the sword of the giant and he takes off the head of the giant. Totally vanquishes him in the name of the Lord. Think about it even in our own Scottish church history. The Battle of Erd's Moss, Richard Cameron praying to the Lord, take the ripe and spare the green, and, and he himself dies that day. And the forces of the crown cut off his head and cut off his hands, and they take them to Edinburgh, and they stick them upon the Netherbow Pike, and his father, Alan Cameron, is in prison, and they taunt him, and they say to his father, do you know them? Do you know them? Your son has been totally vanquished. Well, there's headless and handless Dagon, the stump prostrated before the Lord. We are supposed to laugh with God at this point because Dagon, the God of the Philistines, has had his triumph turned into utter and total humiliation. I love the way Dave, Ralph Davis puts it. He says, in two days, Dagon had the godness knocked out of him in his own temple. <laughs> That's what's happening here. When you see it, you should say, the Lord, he is the God. That all these other pretended gods are no God. Our God has said, I am the Lord, and that is my name. My glory will I not give unto another, neither my praise unto graven images. And as the Ark of the Covenant went into Ashdod and to this temple, the Lord is teaching this pagan people something. He's saying, your gods have eyes, but they don't see, ears, but they don't hear, hands, but they can't handle. Noses, but they cannot savor. Don't you see? You have to help your God back to its feet again. But he's also teaching Israel, and he's teaching you and me as well, that as the Ark of the Covenant goes into captivity, the God of the Ark is on a war march. He's conquering and he's going to bring that ark back into its holy place all by himself. For this reason, God reigns. God reigns. The Israelites are in disarray. Ichabod is written upon the wall. There's weeping and wailing and sorrow in Shiloh. But God is in total control of all of the chaos. And even though the surrounding nations, the world, if we would call it that, seems to be victorious, we needn't tremble for the ark of the Lord. 
Because as we see here, so it is today, that the cause is God's, and God is in complete control of his cause. He can allow Israel and his church to suffer defeat. And at the same time, he can defend his own honor and preserve his church in the world. He can be pleased, and he, and he is, to, to use you and me as a congregation in his service. But this passage of God's word reminds us that though he may use us, he does not need us. He doesn't need us. And we need to reprogram all of our thoughts about our individual and congregational service by viewing this, that it is the Lord who reigns, the Lord who rules. And the Lord who is in control of his own kingdom. So the Lord is the God who reigns. Secondly, the Lord is the God who judges. In verse 1 through verse 4, the Lord has been judging the Philistines' God. But in verse 6 through verse 12, for the seven months that the Ark of the Covenant remains in Philistia, God is judging the Philistines' themselves. He brings plagues into their midst. Now, many commentators wrestle with what this plague was. There's reference of mice or rats, and in chapter 6, they're overrunning the land. And then there's reference here to emeralds or tumors or boils. And so some have thought this is something akin maybe to the bubonic plague, where you got tumors under your armpits and so on, and it was connected with rat infestation. Ultimately, we don't know. But we do know this. The Lord judged them. First of all, verse 6, Ashdod. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coasts thereof. The Ashdodites have had enough. They said, move this ark further on. So they kindly send the ark of the covenant to Gath in verse 8. And they sent therefore and gathered all, all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And there in Gath, further devastation comes. Boils, tumors, whatever is going on here. We read later that people are dying as a result of this. And they say, We don't want the ark here any longer. Let's move it on to Ekron. And when they bring the Ark of the Covenant to the Ekron, the Ekronites cry out, don't bring that thing anywhere near us. Send it away. What's the Lord doing? He's pleading his own cause. And listen, when the Lord pleads his own cause like this, it always spells trouble for the kingdom of Satan. And oftentimes it's manifest, as it is here, with judgments upon individuals or groups of people who oppose and set themselves against the Lord and his church. So in this case, it's the Philistines. They hated Israel because they hated Israel's God. They get the Ark of the Covenant, they triumph, they take him in in this uh, symbol of victory, and they place him before uh, their God. And then everything begins to fall apart, yet they're hardened in these judgments and they cling to their rebellion. <laughs> and God is teaching them over the seven month period that you are not going to prosper in your resistance against God. <clears throat> you know, in many ways, the direct opposite was taking place than the Philistines initially <coughs> thought. They thought, God is in our hands, didn't they? The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is in our hands. He's in our control. And God was going to teach them, no, you're in my hands. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You oppose Israel and Israel's God to your own destruction. As things progressed, they remembered that the Lord did this to a mighty nation, 
before them. In chapter 6, did you note it there? In verse 6, Wherefore then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? If you turn to Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, what is written there about the Egyptians could be as easily said here in this case concerning the Philistines. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. I'm going to smite men. I'm going to smite beasts. I'm going to smite gods. He did it in, his, in Egypt, and now he's doing the very same thing among the Philistines. The psalmist tells us that the Lord is known by the judgments which he himself performs upon the wicked. And both in Egypt and now in Philistia, the Lord is causing them to know that he is, the, that he is God by executing his judgments upon this people. So we see that the Lord is the God who reigns. We also learn that he is the God who judges. And then thirdly, we learn that the Lord is the God who speaks. Now, as I've just said, these judgments were a revelation from the Lord to the Philistines. And they recognized this. In fact, it was obvious to them, and, and throughout this passage, passage, we find them confessing it in various ways. If you look at verse 7 of chapter 5, they're saying God's hand is upon us. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. Now look at verse 11, where you have a further statement about this. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. So they're acknowledging the hand of the Lord is against them. As you move into chapter 6, they acknowledge this even more clearly when at the end of seven months, they admit defeat and they say, send the ark of the Lord back to Israel. This is a complete reversal. They bring it to Philistia in triumph. We have won. Our God has won. And God breaks them in their own land and they admit defeat. Send it back because he has conquered. So what they do is they call the priest and the religious leaders and they say, yeah, the ark has to go back, but don't send it away empty. You need to send it with a tribute and a trespass offering. And so they invent this idea of a trespass offering in verse 4. It's quite ingenious. Make golden mice and make golden emeralds. Make five of each for the five cities and lords of the Philistines because God has obliterated us all and put this with the Ark of the Covenant and send it back to the God of Israel that he might be appeased. That's what it is. It's a guilt or a trespass offering. That he might be appeased. And at the same time, they're paying tribute to him as a God. So call the priests. The religious leaders say, this is what you need to do. So they do that. They mold these little ornaments and they make a new cart. Verse 7. Now therefore make a new cart and take two milk kine on the which there hath come no yoke and tie the kine to the cart and bring their calves home from them and take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which ye return for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see, if it goeth up by the way of his coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. 
So make a new card, set the ark upon it, take two milk kine. Children, you might not know what that is. Maybe some of the adults don't know either. Two milk cows, two cows who have calves. Two cows that have never been yoked, so they're not used to being tied to a cart. They're used with just roaming about the pasture wherever they want to go. And furthermore, because their calves are dependent upon them for the milk, they'll tend to go where the calves are. Right? So take these two cows, not used to being yoked, and are going to, and cows that are going to want to be with their, their calves. And see if these cows lead the cart against their nature towards Israel and Beth Shemesh. <coughs> if they do that, we'll know that the Lord did it. That's interesting because they already do know that the Lord did it. Throughout chapter 5, they're saying the hand of the Lord is against us. Get the Ark of the Covenant away from us. The God of Israel is going to destroy us. They already know that the Lord had done it. But it's a kind of wishful thinking at the end of it all. Well, well, maybe he hasn't. Maybe it's just been a chance. And now we'll know. Well, they build the cart. They set the ark upon it. And these two milk kind go straight to Beth Shemesh, lowing contentedly as they go. As if they'd been used to being yoked all their life as if they didn't have any calves to feed anymore. The Lord speaks. The Lord speaks. You need to understand that this afternoon, that God speaks to sinners in providence and often through his judgments. That afflictions come... And you say within your heart, because you know it to be true, just like the Philistines and the Egyptians, this is the hand of God, this is the finger of God. The hand of the Lord of hosts was hard against Egypt. The hand of the Lord of hosts was hard against Ekron. But yet, like these people here, even though you know that deep down inside, Motivated by a kind of wishful thinking that it were not so, and perhaps it were just chance, you talk yourself out of your own conviction. You wish it were not true. But God is putting his finger upon your sin, and by judgment he is speaking to you in your life. And you ought to be tremendously thankful not because judgments are pleasant, but because all God's judgments this side of eternity have mercy in them, in that he uses them to speak to us, that we might be made wise unto salvation. But if God so deals with you in this world and you refuse to hear his voice, the day of grace will come to an end and then the lot of the wicked will be only judgment with no mercy forever. So if you're in rebellion this afternoon in your sin, and your way is hard because God's hand is against you, thank the Lord for that. And don't pass it off as though it were chance. It's not chance. Everything that happens to you in life is under the hand of this almighty God. If you are in rebellion against him this afternoon, I say, thank him, take heed to his voice in providence because he is speaking to you. The Lord reigns, the Lord judges, the Lord speaks. How then will we make application of this to our hearts today? Well, by way of this question, in that these things are so, choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Because this passage puts questions to us as it did to the Philistines and to Israel long ago. And every one of us has choices to make with respect to those questions. 
The first question to you this afternoon is God or Dagon? Whom will you serve? That was the question to the Philistines back in that day, wasn't it? God or Dagon, whom will you serve? Will you serve your idol that has fell flat on its face before the Lord? Or will you serve the Lord before whom it fell? What did these people do? They picked their God back up onto its tail again. The next day it fell, it had no head and no hands anymore. They still put it up. And then they made the place where it fell a holy place. They, they made their idolatry even worse. The poet Milton said, Dagon shamed his worshippers. Shamed his worshippers. Yet his worshippers worshipped him the more. That's what sin and unbelief does to men it's so addictive it makes men stupid it does you turn to Romans chapter 1 you'll see that Paul presses this very hard in verse 18 and following he tells us the Lord has made himself known by his wrath by his judgment by the light of nature but men don't like to listen to what they know. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That means they sit on it. They press it down. They hold it down the way a wrestler will try to pin his opponent to the floor. They know it, but they do not want it to be true. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. But here's the problem. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. What is the result of sin and unbelief? People make idols with fish tails and men's heads and hands and arms, and then those idols fall and lose their heads. And still men in their addictive, their addiction to sin worship anything but God. The facts say one thing, but they will not allow the facts to be true. They must say another. And even when God makes it abundantly clear to them, they're still saying, oh, maybe it's not God. Maybe it's just a freak incident. Maybe it's just chance. Because unbelief is not a rational thing. Unbelief is spiritual. It is aversion and enmity to the truth, even when the truth stares you in the face. That's challenging to you today in the house of the Lord. Because it could be another day in God's house when God is smashing your idols. And when God is setting something that is most obvious to you right before your face and saying, who are you going to serve? Dagon or me? All your vain idols. Are putting your trust in the living God? You have to answer that question this afternoon. God or Dagon? The second question is depart or dwell. Depart or dwell. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord judged the Philistines or the God of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, every <coughs> Philistine city did the same thing. They said, get the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of this place. Now they knew it was the Lord, and they knew that the Lord was conquering and defeating them. 
And it's good in a sense that they want to send the ark back to Israel, but they're not motivated by holy motives. In their fear of him, they're simply saying this, depart from us. Go away. Indeed, when the ark comes to Ekron, they say, shut the gates, don't let that thing anywhere near us. Does that remind you of anything in the Gospels? Do you remember the man who was possessed with the legion of devils? And the Lord Jesus went to Gadara and delivered him from the legion of devils. And the legion possessed the pigs. And the herd of pigs, they ran straight down into the water and they drowned. Do you remember that? Well, you see, that was salvation and judgment all in one day. And the people of Gadara came out, and they knew this Gadarene because they tried to bind him, and nothing they could do with him would fix him. And he lived up in the tombs away from them so that they could get on with their lives undisturbed. And when the men of Gadara come, they see the demoniac sitting clothed in his right mind. What a wonder. Nobody could fix this guy. He was famous throughout the whole region. So there he is, and Jesus has delivered him. But then there's the pigs. And the pigs are dead. And their livelihood is ruined. And their life is disturbed. And this man, Jesus, did it. What do the Gadarenes do? They beg Jesus to leave their coasts. All that they could see was the judgment. Just like the Philistines here. Maybe like you this afternoon. When God brings his judgments upon you and you smite under them, the only thing that you can see is judgment, not mercy. You don't realize that this God who so afflicts does things like this. He saves and he delivers like he did that man of Gadara. Salvation had come to their coast that day, not destruction. The devil is being driven out. Sin is being conquered. But they're only concerned because they might lose something in life. What do you do when the gospel comes and disturbs your life? When it makes demands of you and you don't want to meet those demands. When you recognize that this God offers you salvation in Christ, but in Christ he demands that everything changes and that all of your idols have to go, how do you respond? Do you respond like the Philistines get that ark away from us? Do you respond like the men of Gadara, the really mad men in Gadara, who say to Jesus, we beg you, leave our coasts. You ought to beg him to stay. The Philistines, when they recognized that the God of Israel was judging them in this way, Yes, they should have sent the Ark of the Covenant back into Israel. But they should have fell down on their faces before the God of Israel and recognized that Dagon was no God. And they should have adopted the Lord God of Israel to be their Lord and their God. Depart or dwell. <coughs> what do you say to the Lord Jesus Christ? Leave me or receive me. Thirdly, Christ or works. Christ or works. When the Philistines sent the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel, their religious leader said, make sure you don't send it back empty. We have to make a payment to this God. We have to offer him a guilt or a trespass offering. They're recognizing that they had sin and fault. What they proposed was somewhat religious and ingenuous and novel. Make golden emeralds and golden mice and give those to the Lord God of Israel. But you see, this God had already appointed trespass offerings that people should offer to him. 
And you read about them in the book of Leviticus. And every one of them required the substitution of a life, the shedding of blood, because the wages of sin is death. You see these little golden mice and these little golden hemorrhoids? Let them speak for all of your religious works that you would dare to offer to God. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? Let's send golden mice to the God of Israel and maybe he will take that as an offering from our hearts. Philistine religion. All of your religious works, all of your own morality, they're just like these golden mice or boils in the presence of the Lord. They will not one whit serve to deal with your problem of sin. But God has given his son upon the cross of Calvary as the great trespass and sin offering. And he says unto you, you will not be redeemed, by, be redeemed by silver or gold. You will not be redeemed by anything that is not the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of your hope must be in this, the precious blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God slain without blemish and without spot. You feel the weight of your sin this afternoon. You, you know that you have guilt before God. You instinctively realize that, that you have to offer something to God because of this sin problem. The only thing you can offer to God is what God has offered for you. The life and death of his son, Jesus Christ. So that's the third question. We have God or Dagon, depart or dwell. How do we come to this God? Christ or works? Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Finally, the Lord is the God. The Lord is the God. The Philistines had to learn it. Israel had to learn it. We have to learn it this afternoon. The God who can take the Philistines to chasten Israel and then judge the Philistines because they fought against Israel. The God who can go upon a tour of providential judgment around the, the, the country of the enemy and make his own way back sovereignly and independently from his exile. The one who reigns and does his own will among the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Choose you this day whom you will serve. But if the Lord be God, follow him. And if Dagon be God, follow him. And if Beal be God, follow him. And as we consider what the Lord did here, we come as the children of Israel did at Mount Carmel, and we say, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And we take this God to be our God forever and forever. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Let's stand for prayer.